Hello, okay. welcome to another episode of History Hack. We have with us today someone we've had before, someone really awesome, someone really fun, someone who knows his onions. We've got with us Matt Pope, who is our man for free history. Hi, Matt. Hi, Alina. How are you? Oh, I'm so good. So excited. There's so much stuff there at work and make fun of you, and I'm really looking forward to that. So. Oh, thanks for having me back. <laughs> do you know what? We love your prehistory talking, um, but we're going to do something quite interesting. We're actually going to talk about one specific site today, um, okay. a really long, like long-standing site that's been around for a really long time, hasn't it? Well, clearly prehistory. Absolutely. <laughs> we're, talk <laughs> we're talking about... We're talking about Foxgrove. So first of all, tell us, well, we know it's a site, but what is it? And where is it? Yeah, well, it's, where is it? It's in southern Britain. It's in West Sussex. Um, it's about 10 kilometres inland now from the coast. And it's near the, the city of Chichester. What is it? It's the name we give to some quarries where in the 19th, 19th, the 1970s, some amazing um, artefacts were found and started a program of discovery that went on through to, to the mid 90s. It is, in terms of Britain, in terms of Northern Europe, probably our best preserved um, early archaeological site from say before a quarter of a million years ago. I love it. I mean, I've got a really weird question to pose here. Why is it always in a quarry? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of really bad luck for me being in a quarry because when I was a child, I had a complete phobia of quarries because I watched a lot of Doctor Who and Doctor Who was always bad things happened in quarries. But this is where we do so much of our work in Northern Europe because quarries quite often, if they're not going for solid rock, which is like millions of years old, they're going for gravels and sands. And gravels and sands which are needed for road construction, they're needed for making cement, they're needed for all sorts of things. So we need tons and tons of it economically. Well, where do you get mass amounts of gravel and sand? You get them from very old river deposits and you get them from very old sea deposits. So um, it's, it's, where, it's where you find um, very old deposits. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So tell us, what's the significance um, of Boxgrove? Well, I think Boxgrove has has two different levels of, of, of significance. First of all, it's absolutely the case that what was discovered at Boxgrove in terms of the picture it was giving us of early humans at around half a million years ago, when, when it was first discovered, no one knew it was quite that old, um, showed a level of sophistication in terms of their behaviour, in terms of their ability to make technology, in terms of how they work together, that wasn't really widely recognised. People were debating, you know, just how, how like modern humans were people, maybe half a million years ago, a million years ago. And we just have these glimpses of people uh, at that kind of age, usually from open air areas. There's very few cave sites going back that far. And these glimpses tend to be really quite disturbed because you're finding them in river gravels, because you're finding them in quite dynamic sedimentary environments, stuff gets disturbed and you'll find lots of artifacts. But actually working out what those artifacts mean is, is, is quite difficult. Well, at Boxgrove, you have amazing preservation. We can talk about it a bit later on, but basically in some parts of this, this site, this landscape, because stuff is preserved at landscape scale, Things haven't moved at all. Stuff that was left behind half a million years ago has stayed 100% put. So it's almost like you're walking into, um, you know, a landscape that's just been just been vacated by these people, and we can engage with them at that kind of level. And it showed us a really intimate glimpse of their day-to-day -day life. And that's really the window um, that Boxgrove gives, and that's why it's so important. Okay, so you've mentioned when these excavations started, but yeah, what was actually found in those the the first excavations? Yeah, so there's um there's several phases to this. First of all, we know that people were interested in the broad Boxgrove landscape since 
the 1850s. Now, this, this guy called Joseph Presswich, who was a, a geologist, and he was a very eminent geologist, but a geologist who was really interested in the kind of near past, the point at which, well, maybe there were some extinct animals around, and maybe there were some strange stone tools, and could these two things go together? In the mid-19th century, that was a big deal. That was a key debate. Could you associate stone tools and early humans? And we could, we could talk about this, this whole discovery for, 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 for an hour one day. But, but Joseph Presswich, one of the places he was interested in was the general Boxgrove area in Sussex, because here at 40 metres above sea level, 100 feet above sea level, as he would have measured it back then, there were beach gravels, there were round beach pebbles, and there was sand. And these contain the same shells you find on the beach on the Sussex coast today. And this presented a problem because it just showed there was this completely different geological reality, this raised beach 40 metres above sea level. Now, associated with those deposits, by the, by the end of the 19th century, it had been discovered there were lots of stone tools, stone artefacts, um, big, chunky stone artefacts that were very symmetrical on both sides and really refined. And, and that's when a series of sites started to develop around Boxgrove. But it wasn't until 1974 when the quarries at Boxgrove were begun by a gravel company called the Amy Roadstone Corporation and a geologist and an archaeologist, Roy Shepherd Thorne and Andrew Woodcock, both went in to map the geology and they discovered artefacts. They discovered very fresh artefacts. They discovered artefacts that fit back together and they discovered animal bones as well. And it was recognised this was an important site. But the excavations never really took off in the 1970s and the opportunity that were there was never really fully realised. That came in 1982 and excavations um, led by Mark Roberts of the Field Archaeology Unit based at the institute that I work at, the UCL Institute of Archaeology, initiated a programme of excavations between 1982 and 1996. These were excavations done to a very high standard. These were excavations where there was a great deal of precision in the recording and it gave us a huge archive of over 90 different excavation areas. Um, and that is the, the big box grove record. Everything reached a peak in 1993 when there was the discovery of fossil human remains, the tibia of the so-called box grove man. And that's where, where I joined the team um, in 1994 and, and, and the last two seasons of excavation. I'm the newbie um, in, the, in, the, in the team. I was only there for the last two seasons in 1994 and 1995, where we excavated around uh, the, the, where the tibia was found. Um, and the site hasn't been excavated since. You've just touched on my next question and I want you to talk a bit more about it because we all love it when someone says, well, we found human remains. So what kind of human remains did you find? And do you know anything about them? Yeah, so... Um, I hadn't really, uh, Boxgrove was only peripherally on my radar when I was a student in the early, early 90s. And I remember I was in my third year of my degree, sitting down, eating some beans in my student flat in Cardiff. And on the news comes this story that a shin bone of a very ancient human had been discovered in Sussex in Boxgrove. And it was huge news. It was in every paper, it travelled the world. You know, it, it, it was a really big story. Um, so this shin bone was discovered. It was discovered by um, a Danish guy called Roger Peterson, who sadly isn't with us anymore. But pretty much most of the box of excavations have kind of come to a kind of a bit of an end, run out a bit of steam. But he carried on digging kind of on his own through the winter. Um, at this particular site and um, one day produced this long shin bone, big chunky shin bone, missing its ends, missing where it articulated with the feet and with the, with, with the, with the thigh. Um, but Simon Parfit, who um, um, is the faunal specialist who works on the box grove material, 
thought this thing does not look um, does not look like a bear or, or a deer. This thing looks human. I think they took them to nearby Chichester Museum and they compared them with lots of other, other tibias. But this shin bone was really, really chunky. Now, we know now um, some things about this shin bone. Um, pretty early on, it was estimated how tall this individual might be. And those estimates came out at over six foot tall, worked by Eric Trinkhouse and published by um, Eric and Chris Stringer, came out as being over six foot tall, which we come on, we're going back half a million years ago. And this is a point in time when we're only just starting to really appreciate that some of our early ancestors like Homo erectus and perhaps this species, whoever they are, um, were really quite tall. You know, that idea that as you go back in human evolution, um, you know, body forms get smaller on average. You know, no, not only was this individual really tall and uh, the height being over six foot, people are assuming this is probably a male, um, you know, in, in, given that in, in early human populations, males on average are bigger than females on average, rather like there's a degree of um, dimorphism on, on average between males and females today. So it was assumed to be a male, but it was also the muscle, the, the, the bone walls of this shin were really thick and had big muscle attachments. So this wasn't just a tall individual, this appeared to be a really robust muscular um, individual. And, and, and on the basis of this one shin bone, which is missing those ends because they were gnawed by a wolf or a hyena, some carnivore had chewed off the ends to, to get at the marrow inside. On the basis of that tibia, the idea of Boxgrove Man, this uh, large, powerfully built, predatory um, human, was kind of emerged out of the press conference and the, the publicity at the time. And we sort of lived a bit under the shadow of Boxgrove Man ever since this uh, super powerful early human. Do you know, I'm going to put my hand up and say I am one of these people that always believed that humans were tiny and puny and then they grew up to be what we are. But telling me about this six foot robust muscular man, I'm kind of thinking, wow, um, I am probably been wrong for a long time, says the person who studied a bit of prehistory at university. Moving on swiftly from my embarrassment please laugh away um <laughs> so we we we're talking about box grove man now let's stick to that subject um so who were the box grove people and how do they fit into human evolution yeah but this is where the whole box grove man thing kind of falls down um a little bit because it's actually quite difficult to reconstruct a whole individual from uh, from just a shin bone. Um, luckily, in 1996, um, a couple of teeth, lower front incisors, these two um, at, at the front, uh, came along, maybe from the same individual, maybe from a different individual. And, you know, the, the teeth looked quite similar to teeth that come from a jawbone that was discovered at the beginning of the 20th century in Germany, near to Heidelberg. Um, at a gravel quarry, it's a gravel quarry again, some animal bones there, some artifacts, and this human jawbone, a big, chunky, robust human jawbone with teeth that look very similar to those from Boxgrove. Now, no one can really define what species you're dealing with on the basis of a single shin bone, but teeth have quite a lot of features that are quite unique from one species to another. Now, this jawbone from Heidelberg gives its name to an entire species of early human, Homo heidelbergensis, so the humans from, from Heidelberg. But again, it's not brilliant um, to just be able to define a whole species of human that, um, on, on the basis of a single jawbone. Boxgrove man suddenly gets anchored to this idea of being Homo heidelbergensis. There's other remains from Europe at the same time, some quite big skulls with large brains, relatively flat faces, big brow ridges, look quite similar to similar skulls from Africa at the same time. And some people would like to see these skulls as going with that jaw, although no one's ever found the two together at one site to know that these jaws really go with these skulls. So it's all a bit of a mess at this point in time, knowing exactly who is in Europe, 
half a million years ago? Have we got one species of human? Are there more than one hu species of human? How different do they look? And where do the shin bone and this jaw and this teeth really fit into that? So these days, um, and I'm not a bone specialist, I deal with just the artifacts, I deal with the behavior. These days, um, we're kind of waiting for those specialists who are looking at this period in time, we work very closely with them, to really get a handle on, you know, what was variation in population like? And one of the exciting things is this is the point in time, half a million years ago, where somewhere in Europe, the earliest Neanderthals are starting to emerge as a separate lineage. Um, and if the people at Boxgrove are different to the Neanderthals, then how did they interact with them? Did they overlap with them? You know, so we might have a lot of complexity going on at this point in time, which is why I leave the bones to people far clever, cleverer than me. And uh, I like to focus on the stones, which kind of behave themselves a little bit better. And there's more of them. I was, I'm going to ask, how do we know that Boxgrove isn't a Neanderthal site? Um, an early Neanderthal site at the point at which Neanderthals are emerging. Um, Alina, we don't, to be honest. We don't. <laughs> that's a, and, and that's a really interesting question to ask. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that's why this, this period, the middle Pleistocene and a great archeologist called um, Glyn Isaac always talks about the middle Pleistocene as being the muddle in the middle. You've got all the people who are working kind of in African origins. Okay, it's a bit confusing, but we know that there's the Australopithecines. We know that there's Homo habilis, Homo erectus emerging. There might be multiple dispersal events. But once populations get out of Africa and start colonizing Europe and Asia, we kind of lose track because there's probably so much complexity going on. And we just have these fragmentary fossil remains that we're trying to, uh, you know, reconstruct really complicated population um, dynamics with. Um, but I think it's really exciting. You know, I love, um, you know, Neanderthal archaeology and you know, spend a lot of time focused on that, especially with Lacotte. Well, you know, this gives the point in time at which they're emerging. We know by a little bit later than Boxgrove, by say 400,000 years ago, <coughs> at two places in Europe, at Swanscombe, which is just in south um, southeast London in Kent, um, uh, uh, and at a site in Spain, because Sima Los Huesos, Atapuerca in Spain, we have early humans with an anatomy that looks early Neanderthal. They have Neanderthal features. So they're definitely emerging by then. But what about these Boxgrove people? At the moment, we don't know. And that's why I like calling them the Boxgrove people, and that's why um, I really like them, because they're a bit of a mystery at the moment. I've got to say, there's so many different human species that I'm losing track. I think I'm going to no, just have you... a, a nice list on my wall here. That's I'm going to ask you to make me one. Well, by the time we're done, you're going to have to give away a history hack wall chart of uh, early humans. So all the listeners can keep up. Oh, uh, do you know what? I love that idea. I'm going to pitch, I'm going to pitch that one to Alex. Um, there's something I'm actually quite interested in because you mentioned something very briefly at the beginning of the chat was about finding uh, animal species that don't, that are extinct. So what kind of animal remains were found at the site? And come on, tell me there was something there that was extinct. Yeah, there's lots that were extinct. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting because we're dealing with southern britain we're dealing with where i grew up I, I was born in sussex so for me this is really exciting you don't have to go overseas in the paleolithic to have adventures and encounter strange and wonderful things you can literally do it just down the road from where you were born if you know where to look and where to dig and you've got the funding to do it um but yeah we, what we have at Boxgrove, like you have in many of these sort of Ice Age sites um, in Northern Europe, are these mixes of lots of animals that we know today that are completely the same. Things that you would quite happily have in farthing wood, like badgers and foxes and weasels and mice and, you know, all the normal things you'd expect to find in Northern Europe. Plus, things like straight tusked elephant, 
extinct forms of rhinoceros, um, an extinct type of bear called Ursus um, denigeri, strange elk with massive um, antlers um, called Megaloceros, giant, giant elk. Um, and of course, these extinct humans, maybe multiple species of extinct humans. So we have the familiar and we have the really quite strange. Um, strange for now. There's always been elephants of one sort or another coming back in Northern Europe until, you know, really recently. So, but a box grove, they, they provide another really good role. And that's kind of dating the site because radiocarbon dating doesn't work that far back. Um, another weapon in our dating toolbox called optically stimulated luminescence doesn't work that far back. Other scientific dating techniques have never been really very effective in pinning down how old box grove is. But because we've got these cycles of cold stages, which, you know, where glaciers advance and then warm stages where things are as warm as they are today. <coughs> and we've got like sort of five of these cycles between us and, and, and box grove. Um, in each one, you get different combinations of different species. And so it's a bit like, um, I'm trying to think of an analogy, you know, it's a bit like a kind of a, you know, a guidebook to telling you where you are in time. Because if you see this animal and you know this animal goes extinct by this point in time, you must be at a point before that. You know, it must be a point older than that. If there's, if there's one type of, um, my, my colleague Simon Parfit invented the vol clock or, or helped invent the vol clock, which looks at different changes in vol teeth, which change through time. If you've got one type of vol tooth, you know you're in one bit of time. So all of these extinctions and changes help you know where you are in time. But yes, if you were standing in Boxgrove half a million years ago, you know, you wouldn't be seeing something like an epic savannah scene with all of these animals in view at one point in time, but you could encounter elephants, you could encounter lions, you could encounter packs of hyena. Um, and we found the bones of all of them in these quarries. I've, I'm really interested that you just said that there is someone who deals with Volta. Yeah, yeah, it's he's, 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 he's intense, the Vol chronology. Yeah, it's, 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 it's important. It's, 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 it transformed our understanding of time um, in, the, in the middle Pleistocene. Animals, animals are key to finding out where you are in time and uh, he's, he's, he's completely on it. I love it. It's just such an interesting specialty. You would say to someone, oh, so specialise and do prehistory. So what do you do specifically? I'm a bold tooth expert. The thing is, Simon is, is also a complete expert of how animals are butchered in the past. He's a brilliant archaeologist. He's just like one of these uh, incredibly intimidating people because he's so good at so many things. But yeah, including bold teeth. Do you know what? I would forget all of that. I think if I was him, I'd walk around and say, yes, I'm a vol tooth expert. That, I think that is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. We just I call really him vol. <laughs> That's what we call him, vol. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So another thing you mentioned previously, because we're going to retouch on everything you've mentioned previously, as you do, uh, is ancient land surface, which we briefly spoke about in another podcast of ours, because um, you found lots of different examples of that as well, didn't you? Yeah. So this, this, this land surface is something that we like looking for because, you know, like I say, we can, we can go looking for river gravels that will have lots of artifacts just as gravel, you know, get, getting washed into the river. And there's lots of kind of stuff in the Ice Age where stuff has slumped off of hillsides and they'll take whatever archaeology was on that hillside and you can rummage through that and find, find artifacts. But when you find a land surface... That's like imagining, you know, imagine a big open area of grassland and it just gets inundated by just fine clay, just sealing everything there. Well, you can find these things very rarely in the Ice Age record. And we have one of these preserved in the Boxgrove landscape. So Boxgrove is this series of quarries, um, maybe a kilometre wide, but we've mapped over 13 kilometers, 13 kilometer wide area, one single soil horizon, one, one sediment that's two centimeters thick that formed over maybe 
25 to 75 years, a couple of generations at, at most, across 13 kilometres. And, and that's pretty unprecedented in, 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 in geology, let alone in archaeology. And what's exciting about it is that across this landscape, we have these early humans, the Boxgrove people, carrying out their activities, leaving artefacts. Um, some places you can, you can survey lots and lots of it. You'll find nothing at all because it's an area they weren't interested in. They were just walking through. Then you might find an area that's a bit wet, that's got some spring water, um, and they'll have a massive activity there, a massive concentration of activity. So we get to explore a landscape that got covered up half a, half a million years ago, and that's so rare. You don't get to do that very often. I've got to say, when we did our excavations up in, uh, I'm going to forget the site that we were at. Um, Must Farm. That's the one. Thank you. How do you, you remember better than I did? You were back with Leslie McBadgen. Yes, I am. I am. Um, <laughs> I was. I was. Um, when we did our excavation there, we came across a lot of, um, uh, what you call it, ancient land surface. And mm. for fun, they made us dig in the peat yeah it wasn't very good fun i mean it stank and it was horrible and i never want to do that again where was the water table it was was just oh just never never again and uh, do you know what i also found that there's just dust everywhere yeah that's difficult especially in like ice age and yeah dust is dust is unavoidable in this type of archaeology but i really really hate mud and I really, really hate wet mud. And what's better about my kind of archaeology that's half a million years ago versus Leslie's kind of archaeology, which is only a few thousand years ago, is mine's dried out and you don't get as muddy. That is a bonus to study even older than <laughs> not quite as old. So um, you also spoke about recording the evidence because... Mm. You know, going from the 70s to the 90s, I mean, that's spanning what, nearly 20 years. Um, there must have been so many artifacts, so many evidential things. How yeah. did you manage, well, not you, but how did the team manage to record all of these things? Yeah, that was one of, that was one of the big innovations at Boxgrove in those, in those years between 1982 and 1996, where techniques that had never really needed to be brought to British Stone Age archaeology um, were, were applied for the first time on such a, such a huge scale. Um, this, we have, kind of have to go back to some sites that were discovered in France, and France is always the, the kind of the real pioneer of, uh, of, recording, of recording Paleolithic sites. And uh, sites in the, in the Seine Valley, um, like Etio and Pont-Savant, where, you know, late uh, Ice Age archaeology that was perfectly preserved was recorded to a really high standard, trying to record the position of every single artifact, trying to create a proper, you know, illustration of every artifact and then recording um, the position of them. So you could reconstruct the site, you could go away and reconstruct the site. And these techniques were brought in into Boxgrove. At the horse butchery site, the one we've recently published, this was taken to its highest level because it was a site everyone realised was perfectly preserved and had to be recorded exceptionally well. And they had no laser um, survey equipment like we have now. They had no digital cameras. So what they did was every day they photographed every square metre over with an overhead high format camera They had to take this film down to the local pub where they had a darkroom set up um, at the local Anglesey Arms. And they had to develop that picture to make sure they had that photographic record. And they had to do it that night for two reasons. One, they had to make sure they hadn't screwed up the photographs because, of course, you know, you don't know um, with old film. um, I can't almost imagine what it was like to, to use film anymore. And secondly, they'd take that photograph back the next day put tracing paper over it and draw a line around every single artifact and give everyone, every artifact his number, record what angle that artifact was laying at in the sediment, which 
direction it was pointing in relative to north. And only then, once they'd done all that, would they lift up that artifact and put each artifact in an individual bag. Um, and that was done for the horse butchery site, you know, almost 2,000 artifacts. But it was also done for sites like the horse butchery, um, the, the waterhole site, where there were 20,000 artifacts. And overall, you know, there are tens of thousands of artifacts, each one recorded to the nearest millimeter or at least centimeter um, across that whole, you know, one kilometer area of ancient landscape. And that's, as you say, an incredible archive. And it's all stored at the Natural History Museum and the British Museum today. And, uh, you know, it's there sealed up. That's just meticulous, absolutely meticulous. I just, I can't imagine how much work went into just preserving one square. Yeah, yeah. You know, because, it, because this is the thing about archeology, span it's, it's destructive. You know, in, in the horse butchery site does not exist. The archaeology, you know, took it completely away. The only thing we have now are pieces of tracing paper and black and white photographs and lists of numbers in paper. Um, but, you know, that's all we need. We can reconstruct the site and we can find out exactly what happened there. So I was going to ask you something before, but as we've come on to the topic of um, the, the butcher, the horse, that whole project, Talk to us about it. What, well, first of all, I can, we can imagine what it is, but how did you get to the end result? Because you've just published an article about it. And also remind our viewers, um, our listeners, exactly where they can get this article. Yeah, we published, we published a, a, what we call a monograph, a book, which is a, which is a report on this one site. So as I said, Boxgrove has over 90 different locations, but we focused on this one site, the horse butchery site. And we call it the horse butchery site because some sites of Boxgrove don't preserve bone very well. Um, so we just have the artifacts. Others preserve lots of bone from lots of different individuals, all showing signs of butchery sites where um, the Boxgrove people went back again and again. But the thing that was always strange about the horse butchery site was the only bones that were found there were from a single horse, a single large horse this wasn't like some diminutive dawn pony this is quite a large chunky horse a large young female completely smashed up bones broken open the larger bones showing the cut marks from stone tools showing that every bit of flesh had been removed from this animal and then the bones that were left behind were smashed up into into pieces um and this scatter of bone which was quite dispersed over, over an area of about 15 metres by 8 metres, also had these clusters of stone artefacts. And these clusters of stone artefacts um, were the waste flakes that were removed from a big block of flint in making flint knives, things we call bifaces or hand axes, beautiful symmetrical tools. Um, and so what was exciting about this was um, these clusters were so perfectly preserved. You could see where the people had been sitting down. You could see kind of imprints of their knee, imprints of their thigh. You know, you imagine if you kneel down and then scatter around you anything. I don't know, you know, pieces, pieces of paper or Lego or beads or something. It, it would leave the, the shadow of where you'd been sitting. But it was exactly the same with this, the, this material. This stuff hadn't moved at all. And the real, real reason it hadn't moved is that it was covered by a tidal, um, a tidal event with just a high tide bringing in silt and covering the site. These early humans, the Boxgrove people, were butchering the horse at the back of a big intertidal muddy landscape. It would have been disgustingly muddy. I would imagine they would have ended up coming away covered in mud by, by the end of it. But this mud sealed the artifacts and preserved the bone. Now, tides happen every you know, 12 hours. So there is a chance that in the 2000 artifacts and you know, 700 pieces of bone that we have there, we actually have a snapshot of human behavior half a million years ago that's just like literally a day in these people's lives. And that's, that's really exciting for us because we get to see things almost as it happens hour by hour. You put this all back together, didn't you? 
We did. Yeah. How did you do that? Um, with glue. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said what seven hundred pieces of bone. Oh yeah. So the bone. Yeah. Si- Simon Parfit and and Sylvia Bello worked on worked on the bone and and studying that. Not so easy to put it together because it's so smashed up and there are bits. There's bits missing because some bits decayed. But with the with the stone tools bits I worked on, um, nothing's missing. So we've got everything from dust size fragments up to big chunky flakes of flint that are about 20 centimetres across. Um, and we've refitted back together l- lots of those chunkier pieces. Not just me, um, but you know, the, the original people who were excavating it in the 1980s and more recently working with a team from Bradford University. And give a shout out to um, Adrian Evans, Rob Davis, Tabitha Patterson and JC Mills who all helped in this mad jigsaw puzzle of 1700 pieces you don't know how many jigsaw puzzles are there you don't know how much is missing you haven't got a picture to look at um but we put a lot of it back together and you can work out what tools they were making and in each case we didn't find the tool that they were making you imagine they got a big block of flint like a like a football and they smash off about you know a hundred flakes leaving behind the tool well they took the tool with them so when we put these bits back together there's actually a hole in the middle of the reconstructed block of stone and we can put latex in that and then we get out on the latex something that looks like one of these lovely chunky um flint knives it's cool i hate jigsaw puzzles but it was such a such a such an exciting thing to think that you're reversing entropy you're putting things back together you're going to work out at the end of it what they were doing blow by blow that it becomes absolutely addictive and compulsive you're so patient i have i'm not i'm the most impatient person in the world but um but it's just (laughs) it's just exciting I I envy envy your excited excitedness is that is that such a word you can use I'm going to use that word excitedness because when we were putting pottery together um, from the ancient period uh, in 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 Italy oh my god I just wanted to throw these pieces of pottery against the wall it's just one piece of pot to an it's a pot it's a pot I hate pots Uh, yeah I'm coming (laughs) around to pot finally I think it's a sign of like I'm, I'm I'm like mellowing I'm coming around to pot Oh, I just but you have actually really int- I mean don't get me wrong we have like thousands of pots from the ancient period that's not me putting you know what's a exciting about pot why I'm excited about pot Go on. is that it can tell you how old something is to like within a few hundred years and to me as a paleolithic archaeologist where I'm happy with a few tens of thousands of years I think it's stunning someone could go oh, look this is um this is Peterborough where it dates to this century I'm just like wow that's amazing that is awesome because they um when we went to the museum um near must farm and they showed us all this beautiful pottery that they'd found and reconstructed that for me is interesting pottery from the ancient times sorry to all my ancient historian and archaeology friends i i love everything about it i just hate pottery but i (laughs) i love but i love prehistoric prehistoric because you saw for example where they use their nails to to kind of put in this design yeah. and and the kind of tools and things that they used was something that you wouldn't think of using today yeah bird bones and things like that yeah i love yeah. it it's just it's just so interesting that i find interesting yeah and like you know coming coming from like the paleolithic where we don't find any containers and you know, just like just suddenly to see well it must have been so transformative to suddenly have these adaptable permanent containers that you can cook stuff in and store stuff in. yeah i think it's really exciting i, I leave it to others to study because um but yeah I, I kind of get it a little bit now but you're you're slowly coming to the dark side of pottery no i would never actually cross over i can just kind of look over the look over the fence and and, and kind of get it and wave <laughs> and be like hello hello a nod a respectful <laughs> a respectful nod <laughs> Okay, so before we finish, how does a hole in the ground in South England end up being so important internationally? Um, well, as I said at the beginning, 
I think it's that level of resolution that the site gives. I think it's that, you know, across the world, you know, God, you know, hand axes. We haven't even talked about hand axes yet, but hand axes, you know, they, they, they're around for, let's see, from, you know, about 1.8 million years ago to around 40,000, 45,000 years ago. So, so that's like such a huge amount of time over, over a million years. They're, they're unchanging generally. They're just these symmetrical, large, chunky hand axes. Well, there's very few sites um, where you can actually see exactly how they were made, how they were made alongside other ones being made, um, and, and what other activities were taking place. When you go back half a million years, there aren't things like caves. You know, we tend to think of very early humans living in caves. Actually, cave habitation is quite a recent thing in the archaeological record. It kind of really sort of takes off after 400,000 years. These people are just living out in these open landscapes. Wherever they're sleeping, wherever they're nesting, wherever they're kind of holing up at, at night, well, it's not leaving an archaeological trace. We can't find it. Boxgrove gives us a really good view of landscape behaviours. And the reason why a hole in Sussex can become so famous is because when you go back this far in time, it doesn't really matter where you find really good high resolution records. It isn't just something that's uh, significant to Sussex or Southern Britain or, or Europe even. It's significant to um, the whole of humanity because this is part of an evolutionary record. This is actually at Boxgrove, the highest resolution record we have for a 200,000 year period globally. Um, so we can actually do some archeology span here that has relevance to anyone um, on the planet. And that's why I get excited about a Paleolithic. And that's why I get excited about the possibility of having a discovery um, down the road that actually has this, this, this global relevance and is, is, is relevant to anyone, no matter where they are. Thank you so much. You definitely have to come back and talk more prehistory with us because I can hear it in your voice. This is not the end. We will do some more. I'd love to. We, do you know what? I think we should do something more about tools because I can hear the, how excited you get when you start talking about axes. And... Yeah, yeah, we didn't. We, yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's definitely something there. Let's do it. So thank you so much for talking to us about Foxgrove. Uh, basically a very interesting hole in the ground that is important internationally. So thank you. Thank you. Join us tomorrow when Janelle Fontaine will be with us. This is absolutely brilliant. We talk all about slavery in the medieval world, which is brilliant because I think we, we know it exists in the ancient world and we know all about it in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. But what do we really know about how it all went down in the Middle Ages? And this is so interesting and so sad as well. So join us for that one. It's a brilliant piece of history. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Elena and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join us on either of those platforms uh, marcus is currently working on some benefits for you so uh, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms we're revamping ourselves on both of them so don't forget to go in you can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year we are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.